faculty management issues. Uh, good to see you again, Mr. Pounder. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, Mr. Glenn Himes, who is the executive director of the Center for Enterprise Modernization at the MITRE Corporation. I want to welcome all of you all to, to our hearing today. And it is the policy of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee to swear in all witnesses before they testify. Uh, would all of you please stand and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, each of you will have five minutes to make an opening statement. Your complete written testimony will be included in the hearing record. The yellow light will indicate it is time to sum up. The red light will uh, indicate your time has expired. Uh, Mr. Messenberg, you may proceed with your opening statement. Uh, Chairman Clay, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member McHenry and Issa, uh, and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to report on the Census Bureau's preparations for the 2010 Census. The Census is upon us. April 1, 2010 is only 392 days from today. I can report we are well on our way towards a successful enumeration. A complete and accurate address list is the cornerstone of a successful census. Throughout the decade, we regularly updated the address list we used in Census 2000. In 2007, we invited tribal, state, and local governments to review our address list for accuracy and completeness as part of the Local Update of Census Address Programs, or LUCA. 11,500 government entities registered for LUCA, and over 8,100 provided updates. That accounted for an additional 8 million addresses that we have added to our address list. Address canvassing, the first major operation in the 2010 Census, starts on March 30th and runs through July 17, 2009. During address canvassing, 140,000 Census Bureau employees will walk almost every street in America, checking and updating 145 million addresses. Then in late September, we will validate the listings for group quarters, which include dormitories, group homes, prisons, and the like. This is the first time that group quarters are part of address canvassing, and their inclusion will improve the accuracy and the coverage of the final count. In December 2008, we conducted the address canvassing operational field test. The test provided an opportunity for our field staff to test the key functionality of the handheld computers in an environment that approximates a real census. Headquarters staff and all of our 12 regional directors participated in the, in the test. The Government Accountability Office and the Commerce uh, Department's Inspector General staff observed the test. The positive results demonstrated uh, the significant improvement that we have made since dress rehearsal and reinforced our confidence in the operation's production readiness. In April 2008, the Secretary announced the decision not to use handhelds to collect data uh, during the non-response follow-up operation. Late last spring, we completed the high-level plan for enumerators to use paper forms to collect information from non-respondents, just as we have done in previous censuses. In October 2008, we rescoped the field data collection automation contract responsibilities. The Census Bureau took over responsibility for a, a, a number of operations including the help desk and the operational control system, which is the nerve center for our 494 local census offices that will be responsible for 2010 data collection operations. We made these descoping decisions to reduce the overall risk to the census. We have done these operations before, and we are confident in our ability to do them again. At the end of January 2009, we completed the schedule for development, testing, and deployment of the 2010 operational control system, 
that will support 2010 data collection activities, including non-response follow-up. We are making good progress on system development and testing is scheduled to begin April 20, 2009. We will also continue to closely monitor the development and testing of the paper-based operations themselves. We agree with GAO for the need of a comprehensive testing program. We believe over the past 11 months we have established a very robust testing program that is responsive to the recent GAO testing recommendations. <laughs> GAO made nine recommendations outlining 28 steps that should be taken to strengthen our testing program. We have already implemented 16 of the steps they have specified and eight others will be, uh, are planned to be implemented. Of the remaining four steps, uh, two of the steps uh, take place later in the cycle and we will implement them at, at the appropriate time and an additional two steps uh, we are going to seek uh, clarification from GAO about their intent on those. We are also taking steps to address GAO's concerns related to cost estimates. We appreciate GAO's recommendations and we recently provided them with an action plan uh, and we certainly are committed to implementing those steps outlined in that plan. In closing, I believe that our current plan has significantly reduced the risk to the 2010 Census and we are prepared to meet the challenges that lie ahead. Members of the subcommittee, the Census Bureau is on track for a successful census and I am happy to take your questions. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Massenburg. Mr. Golden Kauf, you may proceed for five minutes. Up, wouldn't it? Chairman Clay, Chairman Towns, Ranking Members McHenry and, and Issa and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to provide a progress report on the 2010 Census. I'm here with Dave Powner, a director in GAO's information technology team. As requested in our remarks today, I will provide a broad overview of the status of key census taking operations and Dave will focus on the findings and recommendations contained in our report on IT testing which we are releasing today. This morning's hearing is particularly timely. Exactly one year ago today, GAO designated the 2010 census a high risk area for three reasons. First, there are weaknesses in the Census Bureau's IT acquisition and contract management function. Second, there were problems with the performance of handheld computers used to collect data. And third, the ultimate cost of the census is uncertain, although it is currently estimated at more than $14 billion. At the same time, just over one year from now, it will be Census Day. Little time remains to address the challenges that have emerged thus far and make final preparations for the numerous operations that will take place throughout 2010. The poster board uh, to my right, which is a timeline of key census taking activities, shows some of the work that lies ahead and the need to stay on schedule in order to keep the census on track. Because of legally mandated deadlines, the Bureau can't call a timeout or press a reset button. In short, Today's hearing is a convenient way station on the road to Census Day, a time to look back on the Census Bureau's efforts over the past year to address the operational challenges that have emerged thus far, as well as to look ahead to what the Bureau needs to do in the coming months to help ensure a successful headcount. Importantly, the Bureau has made commendable progress over the past year in rolling out key components of the Census and has strengthened certain risk management efforts. Still, the census remains high risk because the dress rehearsal of all census operations that was planned for 2008 was curtailed. As a result, critical activities, including some that will be used for the first time in a census, were not tested in concert with one another uh, or under census-like conditions. The bottom line is that key census taking activities, including those that will ultimately drive the final cost and account, continue to face challenges and the Bureau's overall readiness for 2010 is uncertain. One such challenge is building the Bureau's address list. Because a complete and accurate address list is a foundation of a successful census, the Bureau has a number of operations aimed at including every residence in the country and works with the U.S. Postal Service, agencies at all levels of government, as well as a number of non-governmental entities. In a few weeks, the Bureau will send thousands of workers to walk every street in the country to update the census address list and maps in an operation called address canvassing. Census workers will use handheld computers to collect data. 
As you know, when the devices were tested, they experienced performance problems such as freeze-ups and unreliable transmissions. The Bureau took steps to fix these issues, and the results of a small-scale test held last December are encouraging. Nonetheless, more information is needed to determine the Bureau's overall readiness for address canvassing, as the field test was not an end-to-end -end systems test, did not validate training, help desk, support, and other requirements, and did not include urban areas. Uncertainties also surround the Bureau's ability to implement operations that will be used for the first time in a decennial census, included a targeted second mailing to reduce the non-response follow-up workload and the need to fingerprint temporary census workers. The Bureau's readiness for these activities is uncertain because they have not been tested under census-like conditions. Another challenge facing the Bureau is reducing the undercount. As with past enumerations, the Bureau is putting forth tremendous effort to reach groups that are often missed by the census, such as minorities, renters, and people with limited English proficiency. For example, the Bureau plans to provide language assistance guides in 59 languages, an increase from 49 languages in 2000. The Bureau also plans to deploy a comprehensive communications campaign consisting of, among other efforts, paid advertising and the hiring of as many as 680 partnership staff who will be tasked with reaching out to local governments, community groups, and other organizations in an effort to secure a more complete count. Although the effects of the Bureau's communication efforts are difficult to measure, the Bureau reported some positive results from its 2000 census marketing efforts with respect to raising awareness of the census. Still, a long-standing challenge for the Bureau is converting that awareness of the census into an actual response. In summary, just 13 months remain until Census Day. At a time when major testing should be complete and there should be confidence in the functionality of key operations, the Bureau instead finds itself managing late design changes and developing testing plans. The Bureau has taken important steps toward mitigating some of the challenges that it has faced to date, yet much remains uncertain and the risks to a successful census continue. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Dave Pounder, who will discuss the Bureau's management. Thank you so much, Mr. Golden Cough. Mr. Pounder, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Clay, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the subcommittee, the accuracy of the 2010 Census depends in large part on the proper functioning of IT systems both individually and when integrated together. Mr. Chairman, your oversight of the Bureau's acquisition of IT systems was critical last year. In particular, the field data collection system is no longer spiraling out of control, and that contract is $500 million less than the initial estimates provided at your hearings last summer. Your oversight is needed once again in the technology area to ensure that between now and Census Day, these systems are rigorously tested. Today we are releasing our latest report, completed at your request, which highlights that significant testing remains. Six major systems need to complete systems testing, and much integration testing needs to occur. Plans for conducting this testing are not completely in place. In order to ensure effective test execution, the Bureau needs comprehensive metrics to monitor test completion and effective executive level oversight to keep the pressure on and to manage risks. Our report contains 10 detailed recommendations that the Bureau has agreed to address. For example, integration testing includes the testing of the interfaces or the handshake between systems. Our work found that not only were there not complete plans or schedules for integration testing of these interfaces, but there was not even a master list or inventory of interfaces. Not having such basic information at this stage is unacceptable, and our recommendations call for the Bureau to develop a master list of interfaces, prioritize the interfaces based on criticality and need date, and to use this to develop all needed integration plans. To the Bureau's credit, we are seeing more plans and better metrics, but there is still much work ahead in both areas. I would like to stress the need to prioritize. It is likely the Bureau will not have enough time to test everything and testing the most important aspects of certain systems, interfaces and operations is critical given the limited time remaining. Mr. Chairman, again, thank you for leader your leadership and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Powell, and thank you for this report uh, outlining what uh, remains ahead for the Bureau. Uh, we, we certainly will exercise that oversight to ensure that, uh, that they meet these, these standards. Uh, Mr. Dr. Himes, you are recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, and good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity you have given to the MITRE Corporation to update the Committee on Critical Operations for the 2010 Decennial Census. The MITRE Corporation is a not-for-profit organization chartered to work in the public interest. MITRE manages three federally funded research and development centers, or FFRDCs, one for the Department of Defense, one for the Federal Aviation Administration, and one for the Internal Revenue Service. Governed by Part 35.017 of the Federal Acquisition Regulations, FFRDCs operate in the public interest with objectivity, independence, freedom from conflict of interest, and full disclosure of their affairs to their respective government sponsors. It continues to be our privilege to serve with the talented engineers and other professionals who support the Census Bureau in its efforts to prepare and conduct the 2010 Decennial Census. We are pleased to report that since MITRE's last appearance before this committee in July, that the Bureau has demonstrated continued improvements in managing and overseeing preparations for the 2010 decennial census. These improvements include an increase in processes and tools to monitor program progress and to identify potential risks. We are also pleased to report that many significant issues with the field data collection automation contract have been resolved. Approximately a year ago, we expressed concerns about the cost, schedule, and performance risks for the FIDCA program to the Census Bureau. A risk reduction task force established by the Secretary of Commerce and the Director of the Census Bureau recommended a rebalancing of work from the contractor to the government. The goal was to enable the contractor to focus on the software and system necessary to perform the address canvassing operation. Based on our observations, it appears that the rebalancing has achieved its intended effect, and the risks to the address canvassing operation are substantially reduced. Although the rebalancing was essential, much of the progress is due to positive steps by the Census Bureau's FIDCA Program Management Office and the Contractors Development Team. Both organizations should be commended for establishing an effective working relationship and overcoming the large challenges they faced in the past year. Although we are cautiously optimistic about the address canvassing operation, risks remain within it and other operations for the 2010 decennial census. These risks are natural for such large programs. Census Bureau personnel update and monitor these risks on a regular basis, and constant attention will be required until the decennial is completed. We remain committed to helping the Census Bureau prepare for successful 2010 decennial census. Thank you for inviting us to this hearing, and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Hines, for your testimony. We will begin under a 10-minute rule uh, for each side, and I will start with Mr. Messenborg. Uh, Mr. Messenborg, it sounds like the Bureau has come a long way since our last meeting. Uh, I commend you and your staff. A lot of the work was inspired um, by GAO findings. Uh, so I want to also commend Dr. Uh, Mr. Pounder uh, and Mr. Goldenkoff, uh, along uh, um, with Mr. Goldenkoff's predecessor, uh, Matthew Syrie, for the uh, great work their teams have done on the 2010 census. It was GAO that first brought to this committee's attention the problems with FITCA. Uh, they recommended consistent oversight to which this subcommittee has been committed. Uh, I also want to commend Dr. Hines for the important role MITRE has played in helping the Bureau to resolve problems. And um, let's go straight to testing. Uh, GAO made 10 recommendations to ensure that testing activities for key systems are completed. Uh, what actions is the Bureau taking or planning to address GAO's recommendations? Mr. Chairman, we've, uh, we've provided a detailed response to uh, GAO, but let me just sum up some of the major steps that we've, we've done. Uh, last April, when the decision was made to replan the census and to shift from the handheld uh, use in the non-response follow-up to a paper base, we did a thorough review at that point of our testing program. 
we found some, we did an inventory of the testing and we found some data gaps and then we addressed those by adding additional, uh, additional tests. We also, uh, uh, later last year, appointed a testing officer with responsibility over all testing for the decennial census. And we've made testing metrics a key part of every operational review. So we look at the census, we have about 51 key operations that we're doing, and those are things like non-response follow-up. We have 25 systems that those operations interact with, and we have 244 interfaces between systems. So uh, later, uh, late last year, we also have appointed an integration manager who has responsibility to make sure all of the activities that we took out of the FITCA contract now will fit together and will be integrated. We clearly face some challenges uh, given the descoping of the census. So we took over key, about 11 key paper operations. And I think we are being responsive uh, to Mr. Pounder's comment of trying to prioritize. So we're implementing what we would call a thread test. And those are key activities within a process. For example, our first focus is on non-response follow-up and group quarters evaluation. Testing on those activities in the operational control system will begin on April 20th. We think those two operations test a huge amount of the functionality okay. that we'll use in the other nine operations. Okay, let, me, so. let me stop you right there. Okay. Let me and, and, um, ask you, in the report, GAO stated that in May 2008, the Bureau established an inventory of all testing activities specific to all key decennial operations but that the inventory had not been updated since that time. Uh, what is the current status of testing activities for the 2010 okay. census? At this point, we do have a comprehensive uh, inventory of all of the testing that we need to do. Uh, given the time constraints that we, under, we are under, there will be some operations that we have performed in the past that we will not test as thoroughly on, uh, as we will, some of the new activities. Where, where is the Bureau on the development of the operations control system for paper-based operations? Okay. At, uh, at the end of January, we uh, integrated uh, the schedule for the operational control system that will control 11 oper paper-based operations in the census. We integrated that into the master uh, activity schedule. Uh, so that is done, and we do have a detailed uh, plan at this point and schedule for what we're calling Release Zero. Release Zero will focus on the non-response follow-up and the group quarters enumeration. Then we'll follow with a Release One, which will take on additional operations such as remote Alaska. So I believe we have a detailed plan that we can move ahead and each one of those releases will have testing as part of the uh, part of the sign-off. And, and at what date certain can we expect you to report to this subcommittee that adequate plans for total end-to-end -end testing are in place? There probably will, to be honest, there will not be end-to-end -end testing of all operations because what we'll have to do is we'll test that key functionality which will show up in uh, sec you know, uh, other operations. Uh, what we are going to do, for example, the push of the non-response follow-up into the response, uh, that functionality we can test based on the no uh, dress rehearsal responses. We'll put up a mock environment that will send workload to be, uh, to be identified for non-response follow-up, and we'll be able to test that in the operational control system that it will control non-response follow-up. You, you heard Mr. Pounder say time is of the essence and you still have six major systems that still need to be tested. Um, are you 
cognizant that time is of the essence, that we are, we are closing in on a year to go? Mr. Chairman, we are very cognizant that uh, time is of the essence. We have an extremely tight schedule, and it is going to be critically important that we stick to that schedule. Okay. Thank you for that response. Mr. Driehaus, you may follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have one very br brief question uh, for Mr. Messenberg. Mr. Messenberg, uh, I am particularly concerned about uh, the number of houses uh, that are currently in foreclosure uh, across the country and the transients we are seeing in, in our population. You know, the, the movements of population that we are seeing, especially in the inner cities, uh, that are traditionally difficult uh, to, under, to, to count, um, are, you know, we are seeing folks move around at, at record levels. And, and I am concerned as to whether or not the Census Bureau is, is taking the necessary steps uh, to account for that movement and how you are coping with that. It is, a, it is a growing problem. There is no doubt about that. The address canvassing operation that we will start at March 30th will visit every address, whether occupied or vacant. So the critical first step is to ensure that we have a complete address list uh, for the 2010 decennial census. So that is job one, to make sure we have the, the list. Uh, Mid-March of next year, we will mail out report forms to every, almost every household in the, in the U.S. If that address is vacant, then they they will not respond the form and they will go into the non-response follow-up operation. Uh, we will send an enumerator to that address to see if anyone is there. If they are there, we will collect the data. We will go back six times to make sure uh, that we can reach a person. Uh, if if it is unoccupied, of course, we will uh, miss them. Uh, we have taken some steps to address this issue. So we have added two questions to the 10-question 2010 Census Forum that gets at coverage problems. Uh, one of those questions relates to do you have a relative living with you that you may not have listed on the report form. That will kick off an action to put that into, our, uh, into a follow-up activity that will try to identify uh, why that person wasn't listed. Uh, so that will be one way that we will uh, attempt to address uh, the issue of foreclosures and people moving into nontraditional uh, living arrangements. But I think a key message uh, that our partner, our, both of our advertising and our partnership program will be is to get out into the local community and to convince them through trusted voices in the community that if you are doubling up or if you are living in a nontraditional uh, living arrangement, that it is important that you be counted and that you are listed on the report form. Thank you so much. Ben. Mr. McHenry, you are recognized for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you all for testifying today. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. This is an important matter that we take very seriously, and I know you do as well. Um, Mr. Metzenbarg, thank you for your service. Um, I know it's only been brief. Um, <laughs> your service in government only 36 years, um, and we thank you for it. Uh, when the short timer, Mr. Jackson, sitting behind you, is only there for 20 years, um, we certainly know you have expertise um, and in great knowledge based on experience. So thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Metzenbarg. Um, it's my understanding that there's, there's plans to conduct a post enumeration survey as part of the 2010 census. Is this correct? We do have plans to do a coverage measurement program as part of the 2010 census. Okay. Um, what is the sample size of this survey? The sample size is going to be about 300,000 housing units. Okay. Is this comparable to the 2000 census? It is comparable to the 2000 census. Is it the, the same number or is it just a, it, it's very close to the same number? Okay. Do you know do you recall what the 2000 number was? I don't off the top of my head, but certainly, certainly we can get you that certainly, number. Certainly. Um, and as a bureau um, 
in increased or changed uh, the post enumeration survey for this census? We've, uh, we've made some changes to do a better job of trying to uh, identify duplicates in the census. That was an issue in 2000. Uh, the focus of the 2010 coverage measurement program is, is to provide better information about the uh, components of air. So we'll be providing data not only on the net uh, the net air, but also uh, components of air, such as uh, duplicates, omissions, and so on. Has this been changed in the planning process, or is this a change from the 2000 census? This was uh, uh, this has been the plan during the entire decade. Okay. Okay. Um, and how does a bureau intend to use the post enumeration survey? You outlined generally, but. We are using this primarily to provide measures of the air and as a input to improving the 2020 uh, decennial census. Okay. And is there any thought that the Bureau would use this uh, survey to adjust or, or uh, change the 2010 uh, count? Uh, the, there, the plan does not include any, uh, any plans to use the uh, coverage measurement for adjustment. Okay. Is there any other uh, thoughts to that or any other considerations to that? Not, not in our current plan okay. there, is it? Okay. Um, and yesterday, as I mentioned in my op opening statement, uh, it's been reported that Commerce Secretary-designee Gary Locke met with leaders of the Senate Commerce Committee and according to uh, the news report stated that, quote, so-called sampling will be used minimally as an accuracy check, end quote. Um, I, I, I believe he's referring to the post enumeration surveys. Is that how you'd read it? Well, the coverage measurement will provide estimates of the number of housing units and the number of persons. Uh, then you'll have the apportionment number also. But I, I'm not sure what uh, Governor Locke had in mind. And yeah, it's hard to impute from uh, politicians what they mean. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, it, so that would be somewhat in keeping with what you've outlined, just as a, a survey to check the accuracy. Okay. Um, now, in terms of a fair and accurate census, uh, what's your definition of a fair and accurate census? Well, we see job one is to count everyone. And uh, we see uh, an expanded advertising and partnership program as a key part of, uh, of doing that. We also uh, have done a number of additional things from an operational perspective that we hope will improve the count. Uh, this will be the first time we're using a short form only census, so 10 questions, 10 minutes to fill it out. Um, we also will be using a bilingual form, English, Spanish, that will target 13 million uh, households in primarily in areas where uh, English is not uh, often spoken at home. Mm -hmm. um, we will be using a second mailing, uh, a targeted second mailing, and doing a blanket mailing to traditionally low response, low mail response areas, and then sending a replacement form out to, uh, uh, to another group, uh, to the non-respondents. Um, and we hope and expect that a, that a much more robust partnership program will get the message out to the local mm -hmm. community that it's critical to participate in the census. So in short, do you believe that the Bureau's main goal for the 2010 census is to count every person once, only once, um, and at the right place? That's always been our goal. All right. And so that means a, a, a count, not an account of people. That means uh, an, an exact enumeration and counting. We will make every effort we can to get a response, uh, an actual response back from every household in the U.S. Uh, two of the greatest challenges, you've, you've mentioned this and, and I'm glad the Bureau has really thought through the undercount and overcount uh, numbers and, and uh, appreciate the fact that you, you have programs directly uh, focused on the undercount. 
Um, and, and would you describe the, the challenge of the undercount and the overcount as one of the most uh, challenging of the challenges the Bureau faces in the 2010 Census? Well, the, uh, I think it would be clear the uh, getting people to participate is the biggest challenge. So missing people is, uh, in my mind, a more significant challenge than uh, addressing the duplicates. We have done both things. We have added two coverage questions to the 2010 Census. One is to help us get at undercount where someone incorrectly or mistakenly left a person off the report form that should have been on the report form. And we have added another question to help address the overcount where someone may have included, let us say, for example, a college student that should have been uh, counted at the uh, dorm where they, uh, they spend most of their time. Okay. So there are two questions there. And answers to those questions will generate uh, a telephone call as part of our coverage follow-up operation to try to uh, gather more information to uh, get the person counted in the right place. Well, um, you know, I, I think we all understand the sensitivities of ensuring that uh, undercounted communities and uh, and people uh, are, uh, you know, focused upon and, and ensure that we actually. Uh, get them counted, uh, which takes a lot of effort, uh, a lot of resources, and we want to be of assistance to that with you and the stakeholders in this. And with that, I would like to yield the remainder of my time to uh, uh, the Deputy Ranking Member, Congressman Westmoreland from Georgia. Well, thank you, uh, Congressman McHenry. Uh, first, to uh, Mr. Goldenkoff and Mr. Browner. You know, I have been in quite a few of these oversight hearings, and I have seen uh, a lot of uh, reports from the GAO, and I've never seen one that said y'all are doing a great job. Uh, you know, so I, I know that y'all uh, do a very uh, good job. But this comes pretty close when it says that there are no new recommendations. Now, is that because you didn't go in and look at everything again, or, or are you just going on a past report? Either one of you. I think what you're referring to is our, our testimony today, and the reason that there are no new recommendations is that all our recommendations are. Okay. Can you? Okay. Maybe if you move it closer to you, Mr. Golden Girl. Okay. Sorry. Um, I think what you're referring to is, is our testimony where we said that there were no new recommendations. That was just because um, our testimony was based on previously issued work, some of, most of which did contain recommendations. Okay. And so one of those Congressman Westmoreland, I just want to be clear. Okay. We are releasing a report today on system testing, so not to disappoint. We have ten new recommendations today that we are releasing for the first time on testing. Okay. Okay. W one of the other. Um, things that uh, you had talked about was the uh, accurate, complete and accurate address list. Is that correct? That is correct. When do you think the best time would have been to get a complete and accurate address list? Uh, uh, the best, it is something that, that goes on throughout the decade. The Bureau is constantly working with the Postal Service through the Postal Service's deli delivery sequence file to update the address list. And now, as, as was already mentioned, um, or starting um, in April, the Bureau will go out and actually walk every street in the country um, to verify on the ground um, uh, house, housing units, um, uh, occupied housing units. And it is a difficult task um, because uh, it is not always clear what meets the eye. You know, there could be several families living in there. And so you really have to go within six inches of a house sometimes to see double doorbells, two names on a mailbox that could indicate that there might be somebody living in the basement or in the shed in the back. So it is a very challenging task. I understand, but uh, the reality of it is, I guess, uh, the last address check is going to be the most accurate. And, and all the, the, you know, to me, at least the Census Bureau, from information and testimony I heard today from Mr. Mossenborg, is that uh, they have ask local cities and counties and others to do that, and they are trying to make sure that the information that they have before they do the mailing is also the most recent and most up-to-date and the most correct information. Would you agree with that? That, that is correct. 
You need to do it as close as possible to Census Day, but at the same time allow for the updating to take place so they can do the mail out. So there, there needs to be a, a, some, some buffer in there. Thank you. Thank you. To Westmoreland. Uh, my friend from New York, Ms. Maloney, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'd like to ask uh, the representatives from GAO uh, to respond to the earlier question on whether or not uh, the operational testing on payroll, personnel changes, et cetera, were up to the systems of 2000. Are they at the same level? Are they? Are you pleased uh, and agree with the prior answers to this question that operational testing was uh, correct in place and uh, happening to the degree that it should uh, to make sure that our systems uh, do not falter or fail? You, um, the, no, I, I would disagree with that, 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 you know, one of the issues is that, that there was no de dress rehearsal. And the dress rehearsal, as the name implies, um, it is essentially a, a, a test census. As, and under as close to census-like conditions as one could possibly get um, without actually conducting the census. And so because it was curtailed, the, the, the dress, what was done during the dress rehearsal was, was fairly limited, there were certain operations that just weren't tested. And so the Bureau is going into 2010 now with the actual, conducting the actual census, uh, in some respects um, flying blind. That, for example, there was no load testing, the number of you know, there's millions of forms, millions of pieces of paper that need to be processed, um, and the Bureau never had an opportunity to test under, in a lot of cases, anything close to a load test of what would be a, 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 simulate, a simulated census. Well, so it really fell quite well, short well, of that. What are the contingencies if these systems uh, falter or fail? What are the contingencies? In some cases, well, the, the Bureau, um, if it starts falling behind, um, mm -hmm. there, the Bureau has been good in, in the past um, with workarounds and patches. Um, it all depends on how bad the, the, the problem is. Um, you know, in some cases the Bureau will fall behind schedule um, and that has implications for downstream operations. Um, in other cases, um, it might, things might cost more money. Um, but that is one of the, the, the issues is that in some cases there is no backup or there is no contingency. It has to be done and done right. I would like to. Uh uh, follow up with a question on the budget. You really can't uh, move forward without a proper budget. And uh, do you have a full 10 year uh, cycle cost estimate for the decennial operations that you could give the committee today? <coughs> Mr. Messon. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, our, our expectation is the life cycle cost is going to be between 14 and 15 billion dollars for the decennial census. If I could, I would like to just respond briefly on the payroll system. Uh, the decennial applicant payroll system is up and running. So this is the key tool that we use uh, to process applicants and then to pay them. So at this point in time, we have uh, over a million applicants in that system. We are actually only going to hire about 140,000 people for address canvassing. But the, uh, the demand for jobs has been so huge that we have had over a million applicants. And right now we have got about 10,000 people in the, that are getting paid through this system. And uh, in another couple of weeks that will jump up by about 140,000. Um, how much money were you given in the stimulus plan? We were giving, uh, given $1 billion. $1 billion? $1 billion. And what are your plans? for spending the additional money you were given in the stimulus plan? Um, the whole focus of this is a good, to do as good a job as we can improving uh, the count. And the, uh, the bill language uh, directed us to focus that money on enhanced and improved advertising and partnership activities, and that certainly is our intention. We also hope to invest additional uh, monies in our coverage follow-up operation, uh, adding about another million to the workload, and then the remainder of the funds would be uh, would be there to support key 2010 activities. But in the short term, in terms of 2009, uh, uh, the expenditures will be primarily focused on expanded media buys and advertising and our partnership program. Mm -hmm. And. Uh 
With the remaining money to make uh, other choices, what is your basis for making these choices? Do you have an analysis of what needs to be done or other areas that you need help and support to make a more accurate census? Uh, our criteria ha have been to focus on that ac those activities that will contribute uh, the most to the to the census. And actually, we've provided a plan to the Office of Management and Budget in terms of what our focus is, and we're awaiting their response at this point. Okay. Thank you very much, and our time is my time has expanded as uh, is, is no Thank longer. You. I've used up my time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. all your hard Ms. work. Maloney, I'm I now go to the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, for uh, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Messenberg, are you you're a career civil servant, correct? Yes, I am. Um, with more than adequate funding, do you believe the Bureau has the talent and capability to oversee a professionally implemented and successful 2010 census? I do. Um, I would like your opinion as the Census Bureau professional on an important matter. You are currently operating without a presidentially appointed uh, Senate confirmed director, correct? That is true. Do you believe the Bureau has the talent and expertise to continue planning for and implementing a successful 2010 census without a presidentially appointed Senate confirmed director? Well, I am doing two jobs at this point. <laughs> and I, and I, I guess I, what I see my job is right now is to continue to execute the plans to conduct a successful 2010 census. I have no ambitions to be permanent director of the Census Bureau, uh, but my job is to keep that train moving down the track so when we do get a Census Bureau director, we are in a better place than, than we were uh, you know, before. But do you believe that the uh, Bureau has the talent and expertise currently in, in place right now to execute? I, I believe we have the talent to keep the train moving down the track. I am not going to take a position whether we should uh, uh, have a director or not have a director. We have always had a director <laughs> and I, would, uh, I think a director would be useful for us. Um, as you know, the, uh, the results of the 2010 Census are used for apportionment redistricting at all levels of government and the allocation of Federal funds. All of this is correct, right? That is true. So in your opinion, is it better to conduct a census that is free from political influence or do you think politicians should be telling you how to do your job? Well, the Census Bureau, uh, in my 36 years, we have always acted, uh, we have made decisions, technical decisions and program decisions on the technical merits of the issues. We have not made decisions based on uh, any kind of uh, political pressure. That has been my experience over 36 years. In the, uh, the census is based on the Constitution, correct? That's true. I don't. Do you recall which article or whatnot? Uh, That's right. embarrassing to article, say. Not <laughs> Article One of the Constitution deals with the powers article of Congress, one. the legislative branch of our government, correct? True. So, regarding anything having to do with the conduct of the census, it should be the Congress that has the authority and jurisdiction. Do you agree? You are getting me into uh, territory I am not a skill, <laughs> I am not, not an expert on. It is clear the Congress has a clear, uh, has a responsibility to oversee our operations. Yes, I would agree with that. How, um, how will the Bureau protect the integrity of the Census from outright fraud? From, I am sorry, outright? Just outright fraud. What, what, what protectors are in place to make sure that that doesn't happen? We have, uh, we have a whole series of uh, quality control operations that we have in place that, uh, that check uh, the operation. So, for example, when we start address canvas, well, I will give you a, a better example. Right now, we are uh, about 90 percent done with the large block enumeration. And after that, we're all, now we have started to send uh, QC people, other enumerators out to check the quality of that work. And that is the test. Every operation that we do will have a QC uh, operation attached to it. And that is going to be, um, that will be one check. 
Another check in terms of housing unit counts and person counts will be our POP estimates program that makes most of those. That is another quality check that we have. So you have, if you have an enumerator, enumerator who fraudulently fills out data and then, and then submits these facts, do you believe there is a check and a balance in place? I do to, believe to that we have a, a check in place that will uh, identify that problem. Um, yeah. What is it to keep somebody who is, uh, gets in the form the mail, it gets the form in the mail and then knowingly fills it out incorrectly? I mean, grossly incorrectly. What? How do we deal with that? Well, there'll be some. Uh, There'll be some additional checks against some administrative record uh, information that we have access to, uh, but that's going to be very, very difficult to catch every every one of those if a person added a, an extra individual uh, in the process. But we will we will do some re-interviewing there. So if it's systematic on the part of a numerator, then we would catch it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Messenburg, let's let's uh, go back to the operational control system. Uh, the OCS is the brains of the whole system of the field operations. When will end-to-end -end testing for the OCS be in place? Okay. Uh, the the actual the first testing will be done uh, April 20th through May 1st. Uh, so what we have done because of the timing pressures that we are under, we are going to address key operations on an incremental uh, process. So the actual final testing will, be not, will not be done on all of those interfaces until next March. Mr. Pounder or Mr. Golden Coffer, is that uh, adequate as far as the, uh, the uh, response to, to, to ensure well, I, I think the key, it's, it's, a, it's a tough challenge for them because not everything is in place. So part of what they are dealing with is you want to test what you have now, but I think it is very important, as was stated, that you come back and retest. The key here, though, is there is a lot of, the, there's a lot of this, this, these examples in place. We have six major systems. We heard 244 interfaces, 44 operations. Okay, so when you start looking at all that, getting it all done and testing it in an integrated fashion end to end as you are asking, Mr. Chairman, you see, we don't see all the prioritization and the plans in place. So going forward, what is very important is that we see the appropriate plans, but then we have key metrics so we know exactly what is done, how well it is done, and then what remains ahead to complete. Uh, and, and the OCS is just one example of many challenges that they face going forward between now and Census Day. Okay. Um Mr. Golden Kopp, the, uh, the Bureau has many challenges facing its final preparations and con conduct of the uh, 2010 decennial census. Uh, what do you think places the 2010 census at greater risk and uh, what can be done about it? I, I think the, the really two great, great risks. Um, one, time is running out and two, um, the lack of testing of key operations. So as was already stated here today, the Bureau needs to prioritize um, what it can do, what it can't do, um, figure out where, you know, within all those uh, different operations and activities that haven't been tested, where the Bureau is most vulnerable. Um, and secondly, make sure everything stays on, on track. Um, a third area um, is perhaps more um, marketing and, and promotion because the non-response uh, or the response rate, rather, um, is, is key to success. You know, address canvassing uh, is set to begin nationwide within a few weeks. Um, the Bureau never was able to carry out an end-to-end -end test of the new handheld devices with all other procedures in the field. Uh, how prepared is the Bureau to conduct address canvassing and how can the Bureau be confident that everything will work as the Bureau hopes uh, without having tested it all? Well, I, I think that's, you know, the Bureau does, does not know what it doesn't know because, again, the lack of testing. They, they had the operational field test in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and what that demonstrated was that under the conditions in Fayetteville, North Carolina, the handhelds functioned uh, well, uh, the, pro the problems that we had seen in earlier tests did not reemerge. Um, the problem is, is that 
Obviously, the country does not all look like Fayetteville, North Carolina. You have urban areas, you have more rural areas, and so the question is how will those handhelds perform, for example, in um, an area with lots of skyscrapers? Um, will they be able to lock on to a satellite signal? Will they be able to transmit data? Um, so, and that's what nobody really knows. It, it is a big question mark. Should, uh, should we be worried about the census being conducted on time? I think that it will, you know, it come April 1st, you know, forms will go out by law if they, they need to. Um, the question is really accuracy and, um, and quality uh, of, of the sense, accuracy and cost rather. That's really what it comes down to. Key operations, they will get done. They need to get done. It's just a question of how much will things cost and how good will the results be. Okay. The, at the end of the day, the data need to be delivered to the President come December 31st, um, uh, 2010. 2010. Uh, um, so whether they need to compress operations or um, speed things up at some point, um, that's, they, they are under the gun. And so you know, things will happen on time. It's just a question of you know, cost and accuracy. Sure. Thank you. Uh, when the census, Mr. Powder, when the Census Bureau provided comments on the GAO's report, it stated that it was putting much more focus on testing new things for 2010 and not testing things that have worked before. Uh, what is GAO's assessment of the Bureau's comment? Uh, we would not agree with that. It's important, uh, clearly it's important to test new things, but if you have old things that are critical and you change software and hardware associated with that, that needs to be tested. And that was really the focus of our report. It's really based on a prioritization. So the prioritization might be new things, but it could very well be older things also. Thank you for that response. And I, I will recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Westmoreland, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just following up on uh, some of the comments that the gentleman from Utah had, uh, Mr. Mor Morsenberg, what quality controls are you going to have on these enumerators? We, uh, uh, gentleman from Utah, questioned about them filling out the forms wrong, but. What kind of quality controls do you have on these enumerators? Okay, every every major operation we have um, we have a QC activity related to that. Uh, so we'll actually go take a sample of the enumerations, and we'll have a different person go back and attempt to collect that same data, and that provides us a uh, uh, a, a clear signal in terms of the quality. Uh, if there are issues uh, related uh, to a specific interview, we call that operation a re-interview operation to identify problems. Uh, if we identify a problem, then we will zero in on that uh, enumerator and then do a 100 percent check of all of their work. But every operation we do, we're going to have a QC step built into it to check the quality of it. Okay. And let's say that you do correctly identify an enumerator, what kind of corrective actions would be, could be taken? Uh, they could be terminated uh, and certainly they would be out of the enumerating uh, business at, uh, as soon as we identified that. Okay. Uh, I know that the Bureau, as you've mentioned, uh, will automatically mail a second census form to these uh, traditionally, I guess, hard to count areas or the no response. Oh, that's correct, right. You will do a second mailing. Yeah, second mailing, a uh, blanket second mailing to areas that have, that have a traditional very low mail response. We'll do a blanket mailing and then we'll have another group that's uh, sort of intermediary, possibly under 50 percent. Then we will mail the non-respondents, the, the households that hadn't returned a form. We'll get a form there. Okay. So you feel comfortable that you're going to hit these under response areas very well. Uh, with a second mailing? We, we've tested the second mailing during the decade. Uh, we used it during the dress rehearsal. Uh, we're confident that it will be beneficial. So you believe the second mailing is going to enhance your response? Yes. How will you ensure that the data capture isn't wrongfully counted twice for those that return forms from both mailings? Now, what, what's your system in place there to check that? 
Okay. In terms of data, uh, data capture, forms will come, uh, will be returned and go through one of our automated uh, three data capture systems. They actually do OCR on the forms. Then we will do uh, a matching operation. Every form will have a unique 22-digit identifi identifier on that. If we can't match, that generates a whole host of additional uh, investigative work. So okay, we have an automated process to make sure that we are not getting duplicate returns in. Thank you. And uh, uh, Mr. Goldenkopf, uh, do you believe that uh, because of all the stuff that we've been hearing in the news about we need a director, we don't have a director or whatever, you and Mr. Uh, Prowler, do you believe that the uh, Bureau has the right talent in-house to oversee this 2010 census? The Bureau employees, they are extremely dedicated, extremely competent, um, and they have lots of experience. Um, the concern is, is that here it's getting, you know, with 10 yards to go until the goal line, census day, um, there's no permanent quarterback in place. And the other issue to consider as well, you know, not only who's calling the shots, who's being held accountable by Congress um, to the American taxpayers. Um, this is also the time when the Bureau starts planning for the next census, the 2020 census. And so you need somebody in place who uh, will take on, who will be responsible and held accountable for that as well in making those sorts of, of decisions. So clearly the competency is, is there. There's, there's no question about that. We've seen it in past decennials. But we need someone who is a strategic leader um, and someone who is, you know, goes through the conventional selection process. Okay. Um, given that this short form, and it's only a short form for the census, um, do you think that better equips the Bureau to conduct this census than in previous? Uh, Mo most cinema? definitely. It, it, it should improve the response rate because it's less burdensome than having a, a short form and a long form. I mean, the back in 2000 um, studies have shown that the response rate to the short form was higher than to the long form. So, you know. You're more willing to spend 10 minutes than 40 minutes on, on the right. long form. So it that makes it a little important. easier for them to fill it out. That is correct. And, and probably not as uh, deep a questions or personal questions as it was. But is my time up, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Westmore. I recognize the gentleman from Utah for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Pounder, do you believe that there's uh, enough talent to uh, oversee and conduct the 2000 Census? From a technology point of view, and for 2020, the Census Bureau needs more IT talent on board, clearly. Uh, if you look at what happened last summer with FITCA, the FITCA problems, uh, fortunately we have organizations like MITRE. They hired some external folks to come in and help at executive levels. Uh, going forward, there's folks that are trying to do a good job there right now, but going forward we need more IT talent internal to the Bureau. To, uh, like previous uh, uh, decennials, the, the Bureau is using paper and pencil for non-response follow-up. But unlike previous years, we have had better maps for enumerators, a targeted second mailing of the census form to the hard to count areas, and likely a better applicant pool from which to hire these enumerators. Shouldn't all these factors lead to more accurate census? Uh, yes, they, they, they should um, lead, lead to a more ac accurate census. Um, it's, you can handle the non-response follow-up workload faster, which, which is important because it reduces recall error. So all those things you mentioned should uh, lead to that direction. And if you could just summarize for me again real quickly, the major hurdles that you see and if any of these hurdles, uh, you know, what the cons consequences would be if we aren't able to overcome those hurdles? Well, first, um, time is running out. There's just no time for, for missteps. There's no slack in the schedule. So to the extent that challenges or, or glitches emerge and those things are inevitable, something comes up in testing, there's not a whole lot of time left to figure out what, what the workaround is. Um, secondly, um, the population is complex, demographically complex. Um, and so, as we said in, in, in my statement, that a key challenge is converting that awareness of the census into an actual response. 
Bureau has been very good in terms of getting the word out. People, 90% of the population or so, is typically aware of the census, but the re actual response rate is, is much lower. So that would be another hurdle. Would you concur or disagree that the, uh, the census is rooted in Article I of the Constitution, which enumerates the powers of the legislative branch? Oh, um, I will pass on, on that <laughs> one. I, will. I guess the, the, the question is, uh, who, who do you believe the census director reports to? Well, legally, um, to the Commerce Secretary. And that, I believe, is in, in statute. And is it uh, your experience from past decennials that the director often briefed the president but never, quote unquote, reported to him? Well, I mean, for what we've seen in news accounts and also from some experience during the Bush administration, um, there was some contact between um, the census director um, and, and the White House, OMB. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we've reported here today the census. But communication is a little different than actually reporting right. to. Right, and they're, they're two different things. It's one thing for the White House to um, be aware of and, and make sure that the census stays on track, but it's, that is not a reporting relationship. Um, but in terms of um, holding the Bureau accountable, it's a very powerful tool um, to have White House involvement. The thing is, is that the, the White House, it has to be that right balance between focusing on management and operational issues versus the science of the census. You don't want the White House or any political influence um, on the science of, of taking the census. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just one, one question for, for Dr. Himes. Um, you know, the, the Bureau is working with MITRE on uh, mitigation plans. Um, what are your greatest concerns about um, timetables and the plans? So I think, again, our, our, uh, our greatest concern would be uh, those that GAO has, has put together, that um, the time to test and verify uh, where the systems are working, uh, particularly from a, uh, a system view. So we think that um, uh, there are tools in place that give census better insights into uh, the status of their systems than they've had in the past. And um, the people that are working on them have uh, uh, substantial experience. Uh, but it's still a fairly large burden considering the amount of time uh, remaining to track that whole activity end to end. Thank you so much for that response, Dr. Hand. I, I'll yield uh, to Mr. Westmoreland. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. I just I didn't have any other questions, but uh, well, Mr. Goldenkoff passed on the uh, Article One of the Constitution question. I felt like we might want to discuss that a little bit further. Uh, that the GAO understands uh, that uh, we feel like the census. The origin of the census is rooted. Oh, that no question. Article you know, one, in, section in, two. Article, Maybe I misunderstood you know, the, the, in the Article question. Article one of the Constitution, then, which enumerates the power of the legislative branch. And so, yes. you know, I just wanted to make sure that you understood that, and you were just passing on the question. Maybe for. No, we, I guess I, I misunderstood yeah. the question. I, I, I oh, apologize, okay. but definitely, yeah. it's Article one, section two, and that spells out the basic. Uh, and, and, of the and you know, I think, uh, and Mr. Chairman, I would like to just make a, just a comment, if I could, that we all understand how important this census is uh, for redistricting, for the um, uh, allocation of federal money. And uh, I'm very pleased with the testimony that we've heard today because I think that uh, everybody on that panel wants to have an accurate count, an enumeration of everybody in this country, people who were here at the time of the census. And so I think that's the reason that, you know, there's been so much uh, uh, about, you know, whether the White House wants to have it reported to or the uh, Commerce Secretary, uh, there is or is not a director. I feel very confident from just the information I've heard from uh, the Census Bureau and, and the acting director there and from the GAO and the things that they've looked at that this process is going forward about as well as it could and that there's been a lot of hard work uh, put into it. And so I think that the reason there's so much going on right now is everybody wants to make sure 
that every person is counted. And so um, I appreciate all of you coming. I want to thank the chairman for having this hearing because I think he recognizes the importance to each and every one of us and the fact that we get a very accurate count. And so with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back to balance my time. Thank you, Mr. Westmoreland. And, uh, you know, in, in conclusion, let me thank the witnesses for their testimony today. I could ask just one. Oh, you chairman. have another sorry. question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll yield <laughs> to Mr. McKinley. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to get this on the record. Uh, Mr. Metzberg, <clears throat> from the Census Bureau's perspective, and I, I'm sure you'd, you, these are questions you'd like to answer, uh, any and all the information obtained from the census forms cannot be used uh, for any other purpose, including tax or law enforcement purposes. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Many of us have received feedback from our constituents regarding privacy concerns. Obviously, very, very, uh, very much in, in mind today, especially. But information given by people to the Census Bureau is confidential by law. Is that correct? By law, by Title okay. 13. All right. Um, and the main challenge is, uh, well, getting people to respond is one of the main challenges, yeah, as you mentioned. So um, is there, because people maybe have a mistrust of government, um, what efforts are you taking to ensure that, uh, that people know that any information given to them, uh, giving, given to them is uh, kept only within the Census Bureau and not shared with any other government agency, department, or any other, any other individual? Well, that, that information will, will be on the report form that everybody receives, but probably more importantly, it's going to be a key focus of our advertising message and our partnership program. So it's one thing for the Census Bureau to tell people it's confidential. In the uh, hard to reach segments of the population, our partnership program is aimed to get a trusted voice in that community to tell people that live in that community. And our partnership specialists will be hired from the community that they're working in, that you, you can trust uh, the Census Bureau, uh, that they'll hold your data confidential. Certainly. And finally, if um, uh, you and your staff could uh, prepare a follow-up for this. This is uh, too long of a question. Our time is short. Um, I, I'd like to know the Census Bureau's full plan to minimize the undercount and overcount. Uh, and I know you already have plans in place, but if we could uh, receive that, I think that would be important for committee members to hear the, the full breadth and depth of your plan. And so we can also uh, see ways that we can engage other stakeholders. And certainly. And thank you all. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very I certainly good. appreciate Very it. Very good. Thank you. And uh, the, the first major um, operation of the 2010 Census uh, address canvassing begins on March 30th. Uh, there will not be any other opportunities to build a complete and accurate address list. Uh, time is of the essence. Uh, it is critical that the Bureau work with GAO, uh, MITRE, and use every resource available uh, to get this right. Uh, six major systems still need to be tested. The life cycle cost estimate needs to be validated uh, and, and testing must be prioritized. Uh, let me thank all of the witnesses for coming today uh, and, and thank the members of this committee for their singular focus uh, and, and their commitment to seeing uh, that the 2010 census uh, be successful. And on that note, uh, this hearing is adjourned.